Hello and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. I'm Kat from the Merseyside Skeptic Society and I'll be your host for the evening. If you're joining us for the first time, Skeptics in the Pub is an online coalition of various skeptics in the pub groups from across the UK and Europe. We came together when the COVID pandemic meant that we couldn't have our monthly meetings in pubs. So now we host talks online on the second and fourth Thursday of every month on a variety of talks that promote science, reason, reason and critical thinking. For information about future events, please find us on Facebook or Twitter or check out our website. That's SITP.online. The format for tonight is we will have our talk from our excellent guest speaker. Then we will take a short break, followed by a question and answer session. If you would like to join in the Q&A, please go to SITP.online forward slash ask to submit your questions or upvote questions you would like to see asked. Our lovely moderators will be dropping that link into the chat along with other useful links throughout the night, including links to our Discord channel where you can chat to other skeptics and our YouTube channel where you can catch up on previous talks. Live captions are available throughout tonight's event. After the Q&A, we'll be opening up our virtual pub, The Lock-In's Razor, where you're welcome to join us for a chat and a drink of your choice. Now, before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I have some exciting news. As many of you know, QED is back, and like many of you, we at SITPO are really looking forward to it. However, we know that not everyone who wants to come to QED can afford to attend. So that's why we've set up the QED Attendance Fund. We are raising money so that we can offer tickets or tickets and accommodation to those who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to attend. For more information on how to donate to the fund or on how to apply for tickets, please check out sitp.online forward slash QED. And I'm sure our lovely mods will be sharing relevant links throughout the night. Tonight, we are joined by Claire Klingberg. Claire is the president of the European Council of Skeptical Organisations. She has been involved in, in the skeptics movement since 2013 as a co-organiser of the Czech Paranormal Challenge. Since then, she has been consulted on various projects where woo and belief meet science. Claire has spoken at multiple science and scepticism conferences and events. She has also, she has also organised the European Skeptics Congress 2017 and three years of the Czech March for Science. And tonight, Claire will be presenting her talk, The Sunny Sides and Dark Sides of Being a Skeptic. So please fill the, the chat bar with applause and welcome Claire to the screen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in, especially since the weather is still beautiful and there's light, light outside, at least uh, here in continental Europe. So uh, welcome. Uh, as has been said, I will be speaking about the sunny sides and the not so sunny sides of being a skeptic. And uh, so my talk will be divided into two parts. The first part will be the original topic that was planned, which is using paranormal phenomena in explaining how science works. And then the second part will be about uh, threats and various uncomfortable things we as skeptics face in, uh, in just doing what we do in, in our passion for communicating science. So to start off, uh, I'd like to show you uh, a picture here from a really cool TV show that we're now uh, preparing together with our Slovakian colleagues. Uh, I think the director of the show is watching Petr Pokorny, so he might say hello to you in the chat. Um, by the way, he is a really awesome director because he came onto, a, onto the set as a little woo-ish and now we have fully converted him into being a skeptic and we have pretty much done that to everyone we've worked with so far since we've started doing this show since 2018. Uh, so hello, a shout out to everyone there. So uh, I, will, I would like to tell you first about uh, my experience with testing the claims of the paranormal before I get into how that can be used in, uh, in explaining science and explaining how science works. Uh, so, I, as was well said, I've been organizing or and co-organizing Czech Paranormal Challenge since 2013. As maybe some of you are aware, in 2013, the Belgium uh, Skeptics 
they announced that they would like to do a million million euro challenge for one year and have and have invited everyone else, every all the skeptic organizations in Europe to join. And so we did as well. And we started uh, doing our uh, tests as well. And we kind of realized at that point that communicating these tests to journalists was actually really difficult and it became much more difficult to communicate them to the public because we kept kind of running into, like, so you're trying to prove that nothing exists when that was actually the complete opposite of what we were trying to do. Uh, then uh, we started doing these, like, we kind of figured out the best way how to do these various tests for, like, the basic abilities, such as dowsing, telepathy, um, telekinesis, uh, diagnostics. And we started uh, doing these, like, small tests at various festivals and fairs and events with regular people. And uh, it was actually a really interesting way to connect with people as a skeptic instead of just trying to communicate science, but actually having them live through a very different type of science that they normally know because a lot of science communication is showing how stuff explodes uh, at these kinds of events. So we were trying to show people the theory behind science, but in a more fun way. Um, as we was said, I've also consulted on some projects where Wu meets, meets science. And one of them was the coincidence uh, project or the coincidence experiment. Um, this was a very fascinating idea. Uh, the guy who started organizing it was a huge fan of this Mexican guy who is in Finland who does like these really J.B. Ryan style telepathic, telepathic, uh, telepathic experiments. Uh, but also he uses Gunsfeld, which is the idea of like simulating that you are inside the womb and that will help you be a better telepath. And this man had the idea that, of course, you can never, you can never prove telepathy just on like a one-to-one -one basis. You have to gather a large amount of people, and then you will see that there will be a telepathic tendency uh, or and a telekinetic tendency because he saw those things related. So the idea was that. Uh, a generate uh, this like machine was constructed where there was a dice a die at the bottom and a person would sit down put on the headphones the red light would go on to, to simulate the guns for the experience and uh, this person would push a button and would really concentrate and he would try to concentrate on the number six so the number six would fall on the die uh, what happened here was that some people uh, were very bad and some people did ab abnormally well because they had like 10 tries and the people who were on the upward side of the statistics were invited for a round two into like a much calmer area to showcase their skills and we try to explain that these people don't have an ability it's just because just just math that purely if someone does really badly someone else has to do really well for it to average out. But nonetheless, these people were invited uh, to a, the special second round. And they were given, again, like this very, it, it was like a whole room done into the like, Gunsville experiment. And of course, the results were the, pretty much the opposite of what they were before. Again, you know, statistics sort of is the best magic ever. Um, and then the whole thing got published. And the person we were working with, he cut off the statistics that weren't so good to prove that he was right about the tendency of the skills working if he tested it on enough people. And this was actually a huge lesson for us because we thought that this kind of manipulation in paranormal testing is done by people who are only like money hungry or um, ambition hungry. But this person, he was so honest in trying to prove a real paranormal phenomena, but nonetheless, he still manipulated the data. So that's a very kind of interesting idea to have because we do believe we, we do believe that a lot of people who pretend to have paranormal abilities or claim to have paranormal abilities mean well. And even here, when this person meant well, he still kind of 
did a really nasty trick in the end. Um, and the next thing, like I mentioned, uh, we uh, is the new TV show that we're doing. And in this TV show, we're trying to do traditional uh, skeptic and paranormal experiments. And we're trying to interview everyone from the Wu side and uh, relevant to those uh, to those topics. And then a lot of people from the science side. But unlike normal shows, when you have like the one against one situation, everyone kind of has to bring their evidence to the table. And I find that is a really cool concept. And it was just a matter of time till someone finally did that because this is such an important way to show what it is that we're talking about, that it's not fair to have the scientists present all the proof and then have the Wu alternative side only come in with the stories and having that be enough. So the next uh, part, so as I mentioned, we started showing uh, these uh, experiments uh, at various events and fairs and festivals. And this is such a favorite picture of mine uh, with these young girls. Uh, we were, as you can see, we were doing the traditional ESP experiments here and we let them think first that um, they're succeeding and then we explain uh, the various tricks and unknowing tricks that these girls are performing. And then of course we do consult with a mentalist who does the whole show of pretending that he has a paranormal ability and then he does another explanation as well. And then we kind of explain about how it's so important exactly for these reasons to have a double-blinded experiment. And uh, having this hands-on experience really supports that importance of that because there are so many important things that we as skeptics have to communicate to the public. There are so many wonderful topics and it's also a lot of scary topics, including the importance of vaccines, the need for nuclear energy, um, the climate change, all these topics are crucial, but we go and we start communicating these very heavy, have very difficult topics to people who really don't understand how science works. Like they don't understand the basics of the scientific method. They've never heard of the phrase double blinded, blinded experiment. They don't know what, what's the difference between agreeing and scientific consensus. And I find that not all skeptics can do communicate all topics, and I don't think they should, because after all, we all come in from different backgrounds and different uh, different experience, uh, education and different experiences. And I find that communicating just a method of science is for everyone, though, and it's something that we can all kind of build a platform on. And unfortunately, as long as education, regular education in schools, doesn't really explain this well enough. And I don't mean at university level, but I really mean at elementary and high school level, because all these concepts can be translated into that education level, into that age level. We kind of have to do this work for the education system. And starting off with explaining the scientific consensus of anthropomorphic climate change to a person who's never heard any of those words. Uh, well, they've heard climate change, but not any of the previous words is a really, really difficult starting point. But showing people that, well, yeah, of course, if you're looking at colorful cards and you're looking at the face of your friend, it's going to be much easier to guess than if you turn your back to each other. And that's how we call a double blind study. And that's why this is so important. And you can start building from that. And you actually explain why science changes, not its opinion, but why it um, widens his opinion, widens its stance, or, or changes its view or cer on certain things quite dynamically, um, just from starting off just from a really uh, simple and uh, almost stupid kind of thing like a telepathic experiment. So, um, this uh, has been, like, I've pretty much covered all this. <laughs> And one thing that's also really important is explaining how the mistakes that were made in parallel testing are incredibly helpful for us now, not just in when when conducting a paranormal experiment, but generally when we when we talk about how science should be conducted. Um, one of the most important things is probably the idea that if we're trying to test our hypothesis. We need to do everything to prove that we are wrong. 
And that starting point, that idea is so foreign to so many people. They, especially they believe that scientists are just trying to prove themselves right. And of course, in a way they are, but science incorrectly means that you start off and you put as many obstacles in front of yourself as you can. And once, only once you've conquered all of the obstacles, you can actually claim that you are onto the wrong right track. And just this basic idea um, needs to get communicated before we start talking about uh, more complex topics. And we've seen those obstacles not being put into place in past experiments. And that's why we can learn so much from them and see what mistakes were made and for what reason and move on from that. So uh, one of the past blunders, of course, is the famous story between um, the Scientific American magazine and Mina Crandon and Houdini, where it was really just an issue of objectivity, arrogance, because if you recall, the panel of the Scientific American scientists that went to visit Mina one of them owed money to her husband. Uh, the second one, you know, it was 1926 and uh, Mina, she was a medium and she would do her se seances in a nightgown, in a, like a flimsy nightgown. And again, it's you know 1926. So this other, this other scientist was just befuddled by that. So of course he wasn't really <laughs> looking at where the ectoplasm is coming from. And, and, uh, they made that decision with Houdini being there, like awarding her this, awarding her the their stamp of approval of actually having real ability. So just just having an objectivity and making sure what the motivations are of each person who are who is there is the same if we're testing a paranormal claim, and is the same when we're looking at where does the money that funds certain research come from, and what's the motivation behind that. And I know that might seem like a leap, but it is in a way the same concept because it's all about the ability to stay objective. Um, the next thing is self-deception. And that's in the case of Kluge Hans or Clever Hans. Uh, as you might recall, it was a horse that could do a simple arithmetic and later it was shown it was not counting anything at all. It was just taking, taking cues from its trainer. And now we can debate to what point the trainer was aware of giving these cues and to what point he was fooling himself. However, further experiments uh, with people who were trying to not inform the horse or any other animal show that actually it's called the Kluge Hans effect that even though you are trying to not make it show, make it uh, shown what it is that you want the animal to do, you will still give out certain body cues and facial cues um, if you're not very heavily prepared. And again, this shows how it's important to double check yourself, to be aware of what it is that you are putting into the experiment of what uh, again, you're a personal motivationist, but also if you are aware of your own mistakes and of your own way of how you are influencing what's going on. So the kind of Nina story is more just about like the general objectivity, whereas the Kluge Han story is about us being aware of our biases and about what we are doing to contribute to uh, making the experiment bias. The next story is the probability issue with J.B. Ryan. Um, again, it's, it's a very famous uh, telepathic paranormal researcher. With him, it was all about the statistics. He really believed that if he gathered enough people, he would be able to show that there is really an ability across the board to... Um, to prove that there is telepathic tendency in, in the general public. And with him, we see a decline in how well the people did in the experiments. And generally that's attributed to the fact that they were tired. But when we look at the various cases closely, we see 
that it was because that the experiments did become more difficult, that J.B. Ryan did take certain input from other researchers about double blinding his study, and that led to the decrease of telepathic ability. There is a really interesting story, though, about one of his assistants who purposely hid bad, uh, bad results to make the statistics look nicer because to make J.B. Ryan happy. And so here again, we, we, this is such a big lesson when it comes to doing statistics well. And two years ago, there was a really cool, cool talk at the European Skeptics Congress in Ghent uh, from Nine House, uh, Mr. Nine House, who was explaining the importance of Mars effect for that same reason of the way how Mar the Mars effect was calculated and the statistics done around the Mars effect are a master class on what not to do when calculating probability and statistics. And of course, uh, the famous Yuri Geller experiments at the Stanford Institute uh, of Research. Um, one of the researchers was taking notes and the other one was, if I'm not mistaken, almost legally blind, the one who was overseeing him. So I apologize for the joke, but it kind of was a blinded study, but not in the way that we would want it to be. Um, and we saw that once we started tightening the screws on Yuri Geller and making sure that there actually is a double blinded experiment there, uh, it, his results changed it again. So here is another very cool example of showing, look, these are people from a very well-respected facility. These, are, these were very highly intelligent men but even highly intelligent men become performers uh, when faced with a magician. I mean, uh, they become the audience when faced with a performer. So, unfortunately, if you don't have someone there who's able to see through the various tricks of the trade, you really need to double blind absolutely everything because you won't be able to spot the deception. So, the advantages of doing all this and of uh, communica communicating science through the paranormal abilities. Uh, we get double the audience because if we just communicate science, it's very difficult to communicate science to people who are not a priori interested in science. And everyone loves paranormal phenomena. Um, even people who are really not interested in talking about any other type of science, if you start talking about uh, telepathy or magical healing, or um, we had this lady who claimed that if she takes her clothes off, she will be the mo most attractive uh, woman in the room because she was born in July, so under the sign of cancer. So we know the belief in astrology. Everyone loves these kinds of stories, and they're a great attention grabber. So you double your audience. You are no longer just dealing with people who are enthusiastic into science but you open the door to dealing with people who would not choose science as a topic of discussion or interest. Uh, next, uh, we develop uh, a relationship with, we have developed a relationship with the people who are representatives of the Wu community or of various alternative medicine communities. We haven't developed a re relationship with the people who are up top in those communities, in like all the way up top, the ones who are the biggest gurus and making the most money. But we have developed with a relationship with people who are influential in other ways, um, who visit all, all these places, all these people who have a really good overview of everything. And it helps us build a rapport with them, explaining what it is that we are trying to do, that we are trying to explain how working uh, how experiments work and it's not that we're trying to persecute them but it's about really finding someone who's able to do something and that's their interest as well because they don't want to be seen as charlatans they don't want their community to be seen as charlatans and the best way not to to have that not happen is to try to work with us and we will tailor whatever experiment they want to their needs as long as it fulfills the scientific method and this has become a really great uh, selling point that even sometimes we see or get a mail from people saying, you know, I told my healer about you that he should come and get tested by you because he's really he's the real deal and it's, and it's a shame that 
that no one knows about him as a, as a real deal. So it's been a really great way of making skeptics look nicer <laughs> and make us making us look, uh, well, it's not making it just making us look, but, um, building this kind of empathy between, between, um, these two communities, which are often divided. Um, and of course, generally just the change to the, of the attitude to scientific testing in the sense that, um, they start off with the belief that scientists want to disprove everything and that uh, they just want to, they don't want to really find out anything new. They just want to stay in their bubble. Um, and, you know, that might be true with some. Uh, however, we're trying to show them that that's not definitely the case, 100% of the cases, that science actually is more about proving than disproving. And you can't really prove a negative. So we started explaining that and that has shown, that has uh, been such help when it comes to um, talking about vaccines and everything, showing that, you know, scientists are humans too. They're trying to do their best. Um, so of course it doesn't, unfortunately this is not something that we can just like easily broadcast. This is more of a one-to-one -one kind of conversation during which we can reach this uh, goal of understanding each other. However, the more people from the Wu community we get to talk to, the more it kind of spreads within them. And it makes them talking to some other people in that community easier because they've already heard nice things about us from their friends. So, yes, as I said, creating the common ground of finding people who are really capable of doing things, uh, finding people who don't give a bad reputation to the rest of their community um, and just showcasing to the general public that things are not always so simple in the sense that just because they've been reading their whole lives about horoscopes, it doesn't mean that it's true and look you know, even this astrologist agrees to uh, with us that most horoscopes are actually incorrect. Okay, well, I mean, we were saying that all horoscopes are incorrect, but, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there. At least he, he's publicly agreeing with us, if nothing else. Um, yeah. And uh, if we are to talk about the future when it comes to paranormal testing and explaining science using paranormal tests, the, for me, an interesting thing is cyborgs. So this lady, uh, um, no, the cyborg, sorry, uh, we see in the middle of this photo. Uh, she, it, I'm sorry, she she prefers uh, it. So it uh, is someone who is very popular in the Czech Republic. She, it has lots of implants and wants to get more. And we realized that she, it would be the best uh way to trick us better than any magician or, or anyone else because of uh, of things that we wouldn't even think of when it comes to paranormal testing. So this is kind of a good warning sign uh, and an early warning sign for us to be more careful in the future and also to be more aware of what the Wu and uh, of, of, where, of various personalities in the Wu and alternative community, the various ways they can start pretending to actually have real abilities without... Um, without using the regular tricks of the trade that we've known for the last 100 years. Uh, so to summary, uh, paranormal phenomena are an incredibly engaging topic. Uh, we can use paranormal uh, to the experiments of testing paranormal abilities to showcase personal biases and uh, teach us a little bit more about caution and our own biases. Um, and of course, it helps ours with the fear of the unknown and the fear of ghosts. Uh, that's why there's a photo of, a, of me as a medium here. And this is kind of a, for me, a transition sentence to the next topic. But first, I would like to share with you this uh, quote that my grandma would always used to tell me. So when I was a little girl, I was really afraid of monsters under the bed and ghosts and all kinds of things like that. And my grandmother being a very old school a uh, person, she would always tell me this. The dead won't hurt you, of the living be afraid. So, Radishka Vatskova, my great-grandmother. 
Um, surprisingly, that did not help me as a child to be less afraid. But now, um, growing in age and in wisdom, I have started to understand her point. Um, and that brings me to the second part of this talk, which is the issues that we as skeptics face, uh, the threats of bodily harm and uh, how to deal with that and how the society around us reacts to, to that. So I'm sure all of you know the story of Ezard Aaron's uh, of getting bomb threats and anthrax threats, threats and uh, I know especially you from Germany knowing the story of Natalie Grobs who sometimes cannot even do a talk without having bodyguards there. And uh, Paul Offit, of course, uh, the uh, U.S. immunologist who had to move uh, because of threats from anti-vaxxers, if I remember correctly. Um, so I think all of us as skeptics, we are used to having or getting really nasty messages or insults. Some of them are funny. Uh, some of them are nasty and cruel, but then when that flips over to an actual threat of bodily harm or death, it kind of feels very, very different. Um, so I assume you know that a few weeks ago I received a, a death threat, um, not just towards myself, but to the people around me as well at uh, this science festival I was at. And um, the police did not take it seriously at all. I received a photo via airdrop, so the person had to be nine meters around me. I'm sorry, I don't know how much that is in feet. Um, what is that? Is that 27 feet, 30 feet? Um, and I received this picture of weapons with a sign. I'm about to kill all people here. Um, and before that, an hour before that, I received a photo from a trash can at the event with the words, uh, you are trash. Um, and then when I got that first message, because we as skeptics are so used to getting this verbal abuse, it was just kind of like a funny thing. Like I did not think that it was a problem. I just thought, ah, whatever. Um, and the second one I took very seriously, uh, especially growing up in the U.S. part of my life and being aware of the current U.S. situation when it comes to gun violence and gun control. Even though I know that in Czech Republic we have one of the toughest gun laws in Europe, I was absolutely terrified. Um, and I did drop to the ground. And I started yelling at my colleague to, you know, get down. And he didn't because unlike a person from the U.S., he doesn't have that instinct of, um, you know, someone's going to start shooting, so you need to get down to the floor. Um, I was actually, I wrote about that, and I realized that that's like, if there was one thing all Americans have in common, it isn't Thanksgiving, it's reacting to the phrase get down. Well, anyway, so this my colleague is completely 100% Czech, and when I tried to, when I was telling him that, he did not react to that, and he and I showed him what I received, and he was like, "No, it's it, you know, it's it's a really bad joke. It's a, don't worry about it. It's 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 a really disgusting joke, but you know, we're fine, we're fine." And and but he did say that I should go and call the police, uh, and I didn't want to, but I was also kind of confused because I was thinking, okay, well, no one's gonna do that here, but just in case, there, because we were at an event, in three days, there are usually about 30,000 people there. It's a, it's a huge, huge event. And especially on, on that day, on Thursday, it was just a bunch of school buses. So I wanted to be safe rather than sorry. So I ran outside and I called the police and they arrived 12 minutes later. And their first question was, why did you accept the message? And I tried to explain that, you know, we're at a public event where we're receiving messages from people who are taking pictures with us at our stand. And I didn't really think of it. I just accepted it. I thought it was maybe someone who was there, wanted to send a message of like doing an experiment with us. Um, and they kind of like looked at me that I'm the dumbest person ever. And uh, then some more police came 
And they also asked me, like, primarily, like, why did you accept the message? And when I, like, showed them that I got these two messages, they said, oh, but don't worry. It, this is not aimed at the science festival. This is just aimed at you. And, you know, okay. I mean, I am, I, I, I was relieved that it's, that everyone else is safe. But also I was still terrified because this was aimed at me. And when I asked what it is, what can I do, uh, what can I do now? And the, one of the policemen just said, yeah, turn it off. Uh, yeah, so I was still quite afraid. So for the next day, I did pay for a private security person to be with me at the festival for a few hours. And an hour before he left, he told me to turn on the airdrops uh, function again. And I did, and then he left, and I kind of forgot that I had it on. And five minutes after he left, I got a message of someone using, like, laser eyes to destroy a policeman. And it was, like, a gift pulled uh, from the Internet. But still, this person had to watch me and wait for my bodyguard to leave and to send me this. And I sent it again to the police. I did not call them this time. I just sent it to the policeman I was communicating with the day before. Uh, at the police station because I had to go and fill out a, and uh, go fill out a report about this, and I think it took him like 20 hours to respond. And in the meantime, another one of my colleagues insisted that we need to publicize this whole issue, to publicize the complete inaction. So we did, and based on that, uh, an organization um, kind of pushed a little bit. Um, a charitable organization pushed a little bit at the police to take this seriously because. Even though this worked out this time, the fact that they did, not, they did not react to someone threatening to shoot out a huge festival full with kids is, of course, awful. And we can discuss, like, would, it, would they have reacted differently if it was an email? Would they have reacted differently if it was, like, a post on Facebook? What, or if someone called them? Is it because they didn't have the technology? Or what was the issue here? Or was it an issue that it was like aimed at me and because I'm just like a science communicator, like who would really do that in a serious way? And uh, I also had an issue when it came to, to just publicizing this because I was thinking, okay, so if I publicize this, I'm not going to have any work. I'm going to have all my talks canceled. If I publicize this, we might not be able to be here at this festival again next year. And I like had all these thoughts in my head and I realized, oh, because for the longest time, I couldn't figure out why my colleagues who've gone through similar things or much, much, much worse things didn't really talk about it. Because I was thinking, like, we need to talk about this issue. We need to talk about how skeptics are being threatened. We need to talk about um, the really nasty language we receive. So why aren't these people who've gone through a, a huge amount of hell speaking about this? And I realized... Like, I am just, like, the small tip of the iceberg in this compared to the issues they've gone through. And even I was thinking, like, what is what kind of impact is this going to have on me uh, and on my work? So I can imagine now or now I'm starting to be able to slowly imagine the reasons why, um, unless you really open up a topic, people like Edzard or Natalie or Paul don't really want to talk about this. Um, yeah. So uh, it is, so that was the experience now. Fortunately, uh, the, some police came and took it seriously. And I am currently dealing with um, a different division of the police. However, I was also surprised by the reaction of the public. I've had like a lot of support from my colleagues uh, for example, Vitek Shkorpik, who was there, Yelena Pshiplatova, who were there, and I really appreciate that. But then, like, a lot of, at the public, I received things that were, you deserve this, or what do you expect, or, like, you, you know, if you do this work, you have to expect to get these things. And I was just so appalled by that, because, of course, if you're a public figure, you expect to get... Like people telling, ah, you're stupid or, you know, see you next, next Tuesday and things like that. And I get that. Or if you're a woman in any kind of public place or setting, you're kind of used to getting the dick pics. I mean, you, I mean, at this point, you know, 
Uh, unfortunately, you are used to getting those. But um, this kind of takes it to another level. And the blasé approach of some people or some people thinking like, oh, what were the police supposed to do? I mean, there were three distinct times when that person had to be 28 feet around me. So look at the cameras for that particular minute when they send this and compare, you know, there isn't a person that's all in all three of those, like, you know, where's Waldo situation? Um, or um, even, even just taking it seriously the first time because they didn't even contact the coordinators of the event. I had to go do that myself to tell, go tell the coordinators about what happened. And the police didn't even call them. They didn't stop by, even though they were at the festival. Um, when I called the police and I realized where the first photo was taken, and I realized the time frame in which it had to be taken, which was 30 minutes. And I told him, well, this is it. This is actually, that person had to be sitting at this table and there's a camera right there. And the police said, no, there was just too many people. And I said, no, no. At this point, at the beginning of the day, there weren't that many people in the cafeteria. And it's just a half an hour. Just take, just look at it. Who is taking a photo of a trash can? There are not going to be that many people taking a photo of the trash can. Um, so I just there were so many ways the police could have handled this whole situation better uh but i kind of became now of uh, not like hugely but i kind of became also the center of a conspiracy like some conspiracy theories in the sense that something else happened completely something else and i'm lying and i created this whole story to hide what really happened and i'm abusing the fact that the police cannot say anything about what happened and I don't really understand what those people think that that happened, that I made a story. No, it, it's just completely, absolutely bizarre. So those are just like the various kind of weird things that happen around that uh, kind of situation. And I hope, well, okay, so I actually want to end this on like something a little bit positive. So the guy who was there watching me, uh, in the good way, not like not the like the private security. I don't mean the creepy person, the private security who was there watching me. He, uh, I told him, you know, that you know, I, I did not bother about it the first time because you know we're so used to this. And he said, but you shouldn't be. And I was thinking, well, that's strangely profound, actually. But yeah, I mean, he's right. Why on earth are we skeptics so immune to this? Why are we so used to this? Like, this is. I know you can't control what people tell you on the internet, but the fact that we now are at the point where we accept verbal abuse that some, you know, we as women who are skeptics accept uh, being sent horrible photos of the male anatomy, not that the male anatomy is horrible, but the photos that we get usually are. Um, what happened exactly? When, when was it that we started like saying that this is totally okay? Uh, and you know, nah, just another Tuesday because I know that some of us get really nasty things. Like, um, I know, like um, our dear colleague from Romania, Ovidiu, he told me he gets called Stalin by the anti-vaxxers, and like that's it's kind of, that's also a bit too much. But he's used to it, and I just think we shouldn't be used to it. And I think we should speak up much more and I think we should absolutely blast those people who start to tell us these things because we have to start start fighting back and we cannot let this escalate to these situations where they feel so comfortable in being nasty that the nastiness and horrible things that they say and insults get turned into threats. So we don't deserve that. Uh, most of us really are doing wonderful work. Most of us are trying to educate the public. Um, we should be proud of the work that we do. And we should not let anyone feel free uh, to speak to us the way that they do. So um, hurrah for skeptics. <laughs> and uh, I, um, yeah, I really wish all of you and uh, us as the skeptical movement in the future to have a more kind of positive experience of being online or, or just of, or just doing skepticism or communicate communicating the wonders of science thank you
Okay, um, thank you very much for that excellent talk. And thank you so much for sharing uh, those experiences. Like They sound awful, um, but thank you for being brave and talking about those. Um, we're now going to take a 15 minute break. So everyone is free to refresh their glasses. Um, during the break, don't forget to submit your questions by going to sitp.online forward slash ask or upvote questions you'd like to see asked at the Q&A. Um, we'll see you back here for that at 8 p.m. BST. Thank you. Welcome back. I uh, hope you're feeling all refreshed and ready for the Q&A. Um, we're going to go to the questions now. And the first one is the ever-present Okay, no one's asked it yet, so I will. Do you have a pet and can we see it? And that's from Skeptical Gumpy. So yes, I do. I have a great Swiss mountain dog and I asked uh, the wonderful team here if they could just prepare a picture of him for me because unfortunately, because of the huge heat wave, he is with my parents outside of the city and he cannot be here with me tonight. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure if we can get a picture up of him, um, everyone will be very, very pleased. <laughs> so, fabulous. So, let's move on to the next question. Um, our next question is from Dave J. And he asks, are there any examples from the paranormal challenge that got a statistically unlikely amount correct and nose leaned towards possibly something going on? And nose what? And th the... And the numbers lent oh, number. towards okay. uh, um, possibly being something going on. Not in my experience or not in our challenge because we are very rigorous and very tough. Uh, I know in some other challenges, but that was then always quite clear, clear, clearly explained by some manipulation from the side of the participant or an oversight, unfortunately. Fortunate, uh, but what is fortunate that uh, everyone who does these kinds of challenges or experiments very well documents everything. So if there is some kind of abnormal result, we can check quite quickly if it's due to a mistake or if it's actually something that we want to explore further. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so our next question is from Vic. And they ask, um, have you ever come across any scientists holding par paranormal beliefs outside of their area of expertise? Jesus Christ, so many. I mean, so many. That's the thing, though. Like, if you, if I am just presenting myself as a skeptic, none of them would tell that to me. But when I am there as someone for the paranormal challenge, we start calling it diagnosis engineer because we come across so many people who start off a sentence, "I am an engineer," but and or I also what we come across is, "I am a professor at the mathematical and physics university," but there is something staring at me from the corner of my kitchen. And when I look, it's gone. Um, so we come across all kinds of uh, people where at first glance you would think, oh, this is a completely rational person. But like if you give them the opportunity to, they will surprise you. Yeah. Well, I suppose it, it's just being good at science doesn't make you immune to being wrong or like having your own little blind spots. Yes, exactly. Like, and also, well, that was like the worst experience for me was seeing our mentalists do so-called mind reading with a couple of psychiatrists because, you know, in, that's literally their area of like knowing how these things can be faked. Well, not it's not like that uh, they all know magic tricks, but in the sense that they know what the brain is capable of and what it isn't capable of. And the fact that they went off believing that they had a telepathic experience, yeah, that was frightening. Yeah, it was strange. I think I remember um, hearing a couple of uh, PhD neuroscientists um, discussing acupuncture and how they've been going to acupuncture for pain in, in their back. I just remember finding that absolutely astounding. Yeah. But I, like I said, everyone has their blind spots and like even us lot even skeptics occasionally will find that there's something weird that we've been believing for for ages absolutely, and absolutely. we've just not yeah. looked at it properly it's just that you, with some people you just don't expect it and even as you know even though 
as a skeptic, we have so many experiences with people who we, we, who we would label as rational and not being so, it still comes as a surprise. Yeah. Okay, um, our next question comes from Gray the Earthling, and they ask, what's the best way you found to explain how the scientific method works? Do you have a go-to example, um, a go-to example experiment that neatly illustrates it? Uh, I think a really good way to illustrate it is dowsing. Uh, and uh, of course, you cannot always take everyone out onto a lawn, but just to kind of show like you get like 10 glasses of water and that's a really good way of, sh of showing that, uh, how that works. But also like the telepathic experiment is really good at that because you can show the various levels of difficulty and how adding that difficulty kind of changes uh, the outcomes radically. So those are probably the two best ones for that. Yeah. I think sometimes it's it's even just worth explaining to people um, what hypothesis testing is. Yeah. The, the point is you come up with an idea and then you try and figure out how to disprove it. Yeah. Because because yeah. that thing you can't you can't prove a negative. Um, yeah. And that's by the way, I kind of forgot to say that, but just just explaining the difference between theory and hypothesis and between theory how it is used in colloquial language and theory how it's used in scientific language is a revelation for so many people. But just the fact that, oh, so it's like not an idea I got in the shower and I said, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, it might start that way. <laughs> it might, but the theory shouldn't. <laughs> no, no, quite. Um, our next question is from Grimebeard, um, who asks, some people seem to treat woo as a bit of fun. Any tips for making scepticism more than fun credulity? Um, or making scepticism more fun than credulity. I'm having a very hard time pronouncing that word. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that one thing that we always kind of compete with is a sense of community mm -hmm. and that uh, various alternative methods and gurus, they do provide a sense of home and community to a lot of people. So I think just starting off by making us look fun. And I know that's difficult because like we don't interact well with regular people. We are not the funnest people at non-skeptic parties. I know, I mean, like just look at how happy we are at QED because we don't have that experience anyone else, anywhere else. But um, in the sense that uh, show that, just show your human side and show how cool it is to discover new things that, um, yeah, uh, paranormal stuff might sound interesting, but you know what's even more interesting? How it really works, because that's where the real magic is. Yeah, I think part of the problem is like when you not not exactly correct somebody, but when you go, oh well, yes, a lot of people think it's that, but actually, a lot of people kind of roll their eyes and they, oh, here comes like Captain Facts and stuff. So, which is hard because I think finding out new facts is really cool. Yeah. But, Apparently not everyone feels that way. <laughs> um, we have another question from Dave J. And he asks, um, why did you decide to focus your attention on the paranormal? Because I love it. Uh, even And I grew up, um, so I grew up in a very kind of complicated and mixed family when it came to beliefs. And I kind of grew up with the beliefs that, of course, astrology works. Like, like no one ever would think of questioning that because it was such like a normal part of life. And of course there is a God and of course a, a Chinese traditional Chinese medicine will help you with your allergies. And kind of, it was actually a very interesting process for me to becoming a skeptic because I was brought up very traditionally and very much respecting, respectful of my elders. And I always had this clash of beliefs of like, Yes, this is what my the authorities in my life tell me, but also I am still allergic. So, um, and that was kind of my, my building block, but I still, I am a huge fan of folklore. Uh, I love cryptozoology and I love all kinds of fantasy books and stories. And I love the beliefs behind them and, and the, the truths they reveal about the human condition and the human beliefs and, um, and the understanding of the world around us. So... 
yeah, I, I, I've always been kind of drawn to that, uh, even kind of one way or the other from kind of both sides of the perspectives. But it's a topic I still really adore. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a huge amount of psychology in it, I, yeah. like, which is always fascinating. People are curious creatures. <laughs> yes. Um, our next question is from Grey the Earthling. And they ask, how do you respond to, well, you can't prove ghosts don't exist? Yeah, but then if it's so difficult to prove that they do, do they really exist? In yeah. a sense, like, of course, okay, yeah, you're right. I cannot prove that they don't exist. But, um, of course, no one wants to hear about uh, uh, Bertrand Russell's tea kettle. But uh, that's that's not really a satisfactory answer to a lot of people talking about the burden of proof. But then just talking about, okay, if it's so difficult to prove their existence, so and they are so limited and all that kind of evidence is wonky, is that something, is that a belief you really want to rely on in that case? So kind of twist it around. Of course, with some people, you can have a discussion about the burden of proof. Um, but... The, with something you can't and sometimes it really helps to kind of go beyond the belief of ghosts in the sense that okay so let's assume ghosts exist what other things would have to be true it would have to there would have to be some kind of evidence for the soul or some kind of evidence for just an essence of who we are but just if we look at patients who have suffered severe brain injury and have completely switched personalities and preferences and likes what is there really an essence of who we are that can continue without our bodies? So just kind of go into these philosophical questions beyond just that one topic, because sometimes you kind of have to go underneath it to get the person thinking, not just to just say, yes, ghosts, no ghosts. Yeah. And sometimes there's not much point in really trying to argue with somebody. I mean, if, if they have absolutely no intention of changing their stance, then... Yeah. And also sometimes the more productive conversation is to find out why they do believe that and why, why that belief is important to them yes. rather than trying to get them to change their mind. Yeah, that's another thing. Like, uh, number one, find out if that's a person you want to waste time on because, uh, like, if it's someone in your nearest and dearest family who you want to speak with uh, or just a close friend and you have to, of course, be very empathetic uh, the second part is, like, why is that belief important to them? That's so important. Thank you, Catherine. Just to find out, like, so what does that mean for their whole world view? Like, why is, why does this have to exist, this belief? So, yeah, all these related things are important as well. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from Malcolm. And he asks, do you know if there are any specific parts of your message that people object to? Or is there just like a general hostility towards your scepticism um, when, when you're getting threats from the public or threats via um, Twitter and such? So these recent ones, the ones that uh, kind of brought up all the issues, uh, they were not specific about exactly what it is that the pro what they object to. Um, I do have some suspects in my mind, but I was also thinking, okay, well, I really doubt that it's going to be a pissed off dowser or someone selling crystals that just, it has to be someone who's very heavily emotionally invested in their belief. And of course, dowsers are invested in their beliefs as are people who are selling crystals, but it has to be something a bit more stronger than that. So that was, um, that was like that. But in general, usually a lot of hostility is tied to us, um, giving out this kind of anti-prize to personalities that have been giving a large platform but have been spouting a lot of misinformation especially now during COVID but also before about various um, um, various uh, alternative medicine issues and just general misinformation in the public even about things like evolution um, and this year we did give the award to a very prominent Czech pro-life organization so um that has stirred up a lot. And we've also given it to this very rich Czech person who uh, said that COVID doesn't affect kids and they shouldn't be vaccinated. Uh, so that's kind of another group who, who uh, the anti-vaxxers have a lot large following. And because this person is a prominent figure and he's like this um, 
very kind of benevolent millionaire uh, aura guy. Um, I think a lot of people kind of thought, oh, well, you don't understand his genius. You know, it just shows how stupid you are. So that's like the antiprices are one thing. And then sometimes it's like specific to certain things. Like when we did like this astral traveling experiment, we got a lot of hate that we did it incorrectly. I mean, we did exactly like the person told us to do it, the person we were testing. Yeah. So that's kind of within them to discuss that. So it's generally we get, oh, you're a bunch of egomaniacs and horrible conservative people who don't understand anything and don't won't ever step out of their own shadow. And then sometimes it's specific to like an event or uh, an experiment that we've done. Yeah. It to some extent it it would it would make sense if the backlash is mainly around topics what that are like basically life and death topics um, like vaccinations and so forth. But yeah, it would be difficult to imagine somebody getting super angry and agitated over like dowsing being disproved or or what have you. Oh, they do, but like <laughs> you know, it's still within the limit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so our next question is from Linda L8A, um, who asks, should people weigh in when they see abuse? A couple of times I've challenged a Twitter reply, but mostly I keep my head down for fear of being piled on myself. Yeah. So um, if you don't feel like uh, going into the battle, which is absolutely fine, uh, because it becomes toxic really, really quickly. And I know myself that just it even like cramps up your whole stomach sometimes. So I completely get that. You can always at least report that tweet, if nothing else, if you don't feel like engaging. Um, you can message the person who's being piled up on privately and ask if they're okay, if there's anything else you can do. Um, you can uh, uh, report the profile if it's someone who's doing a very heavy amount of abuse. So there's all these kind of other things you can do, which are don't involve you directly, but you can do anonymously. And maybe if it's possible, uh, if there's any other like skeptics involved or any other friends involved in those kinds of discussion, ask them to do the same, to report the tweet, report the profile. And sometimes it's better not to engage, so not to give, not to give that tweet a boost. So it's up to you which, which solution you choose, but don't worry, you don't always just have to go out. You can also just comfort the person or you can anonymously report the tweet or the profile. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, anonymous re anonymously reporting is uh, always a, a safe option, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, our next question is from Paul, a.k.a. Picticule, who asks, did you ever consider, consider adopting an online alias in order to deflect threats? Do you think such a, a strategy would work? You mean like arguing uh, for myself as someone else? Like saying, uh, Possibly. Uh, okay, so, um, well, our director here, he, I hope, I don't think anyone who is in the affected group was going to hear this, so I'll, I'll say that and I'll ask him, we need to cut this part out, but he has a couple of profiles that he uses within the community to kind of support us. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and it's like don't be afraid go into that you know go in and get go get on camera uh but like having an alias um to deflect my uh from or to like for, like um support myself no and maybe the strategy would work but i really don't like the idea of being anonymous in the sense that i'm worried what i would do <laughs> uh <laughs> i know because when I'm speaking as me and, and, I, and everyone knows that it's me, I always try to be like super nice or I try to be as nice as long as I possibly can be nice. And, um, and usually I get much meaner towards other skeptics who are not being nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I am towards uh, woo people because I think we as skeptics should support each other and even if criticism of our work which is completely legitimate and we should criticize each other's work we should do it in a way that's that builds each other up and it should be constructive criticism and not pointing fingers so um i'm very touchy about that about uh but yeah i think that if i was anonymous online i would just 
just let my opinions fly. Like, oh my God, what an asshole you are. <laughs> and um, I don't know if I would be able to come back from that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it would be... It would be a shame to have to share all your work and all your thoughts anonymously, though, right? Like, it just, it seems like that that would be an unfortunate step to have to take just to protect yourself from I thought that I would be people. me, and I would switch and be someone else, and I would be switching <laughs> back and forth. That was my understanding, so. <laughs> I, I think there are a couple of different ways of, uh, of thinking about it there. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, our next question is from Crafty. And they ask, like yourself, Shay Moss's family has been traumatized by misinformation. Can you offer advice for other victims of conspiratorial twaddle-based activism? So, um, I made the huge mistake uh, of not pushing. And because I, there was one of me and four of the police when I was dealing with this issue and because they all took it so lightly, I was completely thrown off guard. And, he, and I am someone who will always fight for other people. Mm-hmm. And I am not someone who, I know it sounds strange, but I don't, like, I don't feel good fighting for myself. I'm not used to that. I will fight like a mama bear for everyone else. And uh, when, when uh, the four of them were so dismissive, and I went to the police station and my husband was about to go in with me to the, to the uh, room to pull out the report. The policeman barred him from entering. And I, and you know, I am very well versed in, because I'm uh, also an American citizen, so I'm re- very well versed in my uh, rights as a U.S. citizen when it comes to the police. But I've never really bothered to learn about my rights here because I have a very different relationship to the police here than I have with the police in the US. Um, so I didn't, I thought, oh, okay, maybe I can only, I could only go in if he was a, my lawyer, but because he's a family member, he can't. And then later I found out, no, that's not true. I'm absolutely allowed to have someone there. Um, so I would definitely say always, always stand your ground in the sense that when dealing with police, make sure that they take everything what's going on seriously. If you don't feel strong enough in the moment or you're not sure, call someone that will be your ally and who that will be your advocate. And it doesn't have to be an advocate in the sense of lawyer. It can be just another colleague there or it can be uh, a family member, a friend, uh, anyone that will help you fight for you and to get the security and the service that is necessary in that moment to make sure that you are okay and everyone else is okay. And also, also long-term as well, make sure that there's someone who's going to be breathing down the neck of the police to make sure that they do their job essentially. Yeah. Um, Our next question is from anonymous and they ask, uh, did police, um, did the police or did they offer any, Sorry. Did police offer any digital forensics on your phone to preserve the evidence? So because AirDrop is completely anonymous, uh, I did give them all the information of the photos and I gave them all the data from the photos. And that was all they wanted. They did not want anything else. Um, Just like the information underneath the photos. And yeah. So that was that was it. Uh, I was expecting them to want me to show up at some IT center for them to check, do some more checks, but because AirDrop is such an anonymized service and you can be completely anonymous, to even erase the kind of type of phone you're sending it from, uh, there was no need, or not, not not no need, but like there was no reason for it. Yeah. Okay, and I. So our next question is from Steel Wolf, also known as Don. Um, and he asks, have you seen the documentary TV series known as Supernatural? And if so, what do you think of this as, as a resort, uh, as, as a resource tool? Um, and also your second question that relates to that, what team am I on? Uh, so yeah. I am a strong believer in uh, putting salt uh, on your threshold to keep the demons out. Like, how else? How else would you do that? Like, yeah. I mean, I, there are no other solutions. Um, no, but to be serious, I've actually come across a lot of people who use the TV show Supernatural 
as a resource who like actually do the rituals that people that uh, uh, Dean and Sam do. And to be honest, I absolutely adore that TV show. I, I'm a huge fan, uh, but I've never actually thought about doing it in practice. Uh, but I've come across people who like pause the episode and they start like doing the circle, the pentagrams and trying to like replicate all the runes and, and all the Latin and everything. Um, yeah. So, and ask the question of which team I'm on, I'm just going to be in all the way. <laughs> okay. Fabulous. Um, I, I would love to tell you what team I was on, but I, I've never watched Supernatural. Um, but so I think that takes us to the end of our Q and A. Um, so thank you very much for all of that. And, um, that's it for another week. Uh, we'll be back again on the 14th of July. Uh, so please join us again in three weeks' time for Dr. Erin Williams with her talk, Bottles, Boobs and Buncombe, Busting Infant Feeding Myths. So that's sure to be another great talk. Um, thank you once again to Claire for another excellent talk. And I'd like to thank tonight's behind the scenes team, which was Malcolm and Matty on tech and Cleo as my backup MC who helped me sort through the questions. We will be opening the doors to our virtual pub, The Lock-In's Razor, via Zoom, and everyone is welcome to be there. And there's no need for you to turn your camera on or to announce yourself if you don't feel comfortable doing so. There should be links to the call in the chat, but if you can't see the links there, it can also be found on our website at sitp.online. Thanks again and see you soon. <laughs>